I know when I say to everyone, take 60 seconds, that could really mean anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. All right, girls, you've had your fun. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. I certainly hope everyone had a great week. I know I did. Uh, today, uh, I, I couldn't start my sermon without thanking everyone for the wonderful gifts uh, and recognition that you gave for uh, Pastor Eddie and for Courtney and for myself and Jessica and my family. Uh, we are so abundantly blessed to serve this congregation. Thank you so very much. And for the record, the coffee maker is awesome. <laughs> Every time I went to use it this week, um, I learned just another thing that it can do. Um, I mean, I was frothing milk with this thing, uh, which was pretty awesome. I haven't done that in a long time, but, but all that to say, you guys are the best. Thank you very much. And uh, another gift that came with it, um, I don't know if everyone got to see it, it was a coffee mug that came with it. And on one side, it said, be careful, be careful, or you will wind up in my next sermon. <laughs> and boy, if that isn't the truth, I don't know what is. Because, did you pick it out, Travis? No? Okay, okay. I, I'm always looking for real-life examples of my sermons. And um, last week, my wonderful, beautiful, amazing love of my life, she's right here, Jessica, she's walking in right now. Uh, she spoke, yeah, yeah, hey. She spoke on the power of words. And she did a great job explaining just how powerful our words are can be. And um, all that to say reminds me about a story about someone I love, um, and that someone is my son, Liam. And, uh, and he knows I'm going to be telling him this story. I, I did ask his permission if it was okay. Um, it was about three years ago, we took our first family trip to Pigeon Forge uh, in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Has anyone ever been to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a trip. Um, there are museums, there are buildings that are upside down. Um, for some reason, there are cowboy boots for sale everywhere. Um, it's where Dollywood is. And then you go another 10 miles up and there's hiking. Uh, name it, they have it. But they also have go-karting. And uh, that is not appealing to me whatsoever. Um, not that I can't handle it. It's just I, I would rather not go go-karting. And... Um, my son Liam said to me, Dad, when are we going to go go-karting? And I wasn't exactly excited about this question. I said, Liam, you can go go-karting when pigs fly. Now, Liam obviously didn't look upon this favorably because all he wanted to do was go go-karting. I can't make this up. Five minutes later, we drove right past that thing. The power of words is a strong power indeed. Liam looks up and said, Dad, I think we're going go-karting. For the record, I took Liam go-karting. I can't make that up. I really can't. Because when we use idle words, we should be held to it, don't you think? And we are, in many ways. Even Matthew 12, 36 says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. Now, I don't know if I'm going to get to heaven and God's going to say, hey, remember that pig's flying line you once used? I, I don't know, he might, but, but I held true to it. So I thought it best to act on some empty words that I had spoken, and I'm glad that I did. Our words carry such a significant amount of weight. And we can speak negatively about a situation, as Jessica talked about last week, or we have an opportunity to invite God in. Wouldn't you say? And there are countless examples throughout Scripture of people doing both. 
Uh, but this week, I'm going to be talking about one of the negative ways that we use our words. And it's, it's kind of this week's buzzword. It's criticism. And what is criticism? It's nothing more than making a judgment on something or someone. Now, there's constructive criticism. It's not hurtful. It's, you know, you're genuinely trying to help someone, right? But let me ask, has anyone ever heard the phrase, when you point the finger, there are three fingers pointing back at you? And I believe that that's an important lesson when we criticize one another. So the first thing I want you to know what I'm not speaking about is discernment. Very important distinction. A few weeks ago, I spoke about how it is our responsibility to judge spirits, and it's called discernment. If you start spending time with someone who's making bad decisions, lying, cheating, who knows, and they begin telling you that maybe you should do it too, well, I think that's a time to judge spirits, don't you? That's a time to discern and most likely pull away from that person if you're not going to influence them positively. And when you're praying and you think you're hearing God telling you to do something, what do we pray for? Discernment. Every time. Judge some spirits. Maybe even have a friend pray with you and you can reach the decision together. And even if you pray for discernment and find out that it's God that's talking to you, I can promise you this, he won't be mad at you for it because he told us to do it. It's a wise decision every single time. So I want everyone to know I am not talking about discernment. Discernment is good, it's right, and it's commanded of us. But what about when it comes to people? Are we allowed to judge people? Because we are judgmental by nature, wouldn't you say? On top of that, the world all but tells us that we are forbidden to judge, no matter what decision they make, no matter what. It, it's, it's not a very good distinction, but we are to discern what is right and wrong, and we should always make a point to. But even that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is criticism. Unfair, misunderstood, irresponsible, superficial, and unreasonable criticism. Right? Seeing some heads nod, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Know for a fact that every last one of us here has at some point or another witnessed or experienced or maybe is guilty of this kind of criticism. And it's okay. I'd be willing to bet that you are in the extreme majority if you are, because I'm pretty sure that I am too. But before we get into some scripture, I want to make a few points about criticism. It's not helpful. It doesn't offer solutions. It can be destructive or belittling and nagging. Have any of you ever been, uh, been, been the subject of this? And, and I still remember when I was in eighth grade, I was giving a speech to my, to my English class. And, and, you know, I love public speaking right? I better. I, I do this at least 50 times a year, maybe less. But I worked really hard on my speech. 13-year-old Bill was really excited about this speech. It was all on metaphors, and it was out of the box, and it was like something I'd never written before. I used metaphors to describe the metaphors in my speech. My teacher was going to be so impressed. I even threw in a few jokes leaving them wanting more, and I just knew I was God's gift to public speaking. I was ready. And I got in front of my class. I gave my speech that I memorized, mind you. And when it was over, my teacher said three words. That was terrible. <laughs> in front of the class. <laughs> True story. True story. And I had a friend later who saw me that, that day later on. He said, well, if it isn't the public speaker. And after that rejection, I never thought I would have a career in public speaking. Never. But I had another teacher. She was our music teacher. And when I auditioned for the school musical that spring, I had never sung a note in my life. Uh, she worked with me 
for the next five years. And I joined the chorus. Um, even if I had to give a speech to, to the school or in classes for other classes, she coached me. She coached me every step of the way. She wasn't critical in the negative sense. She was constructive. She witnessed me make mistakes in front of people, and she would take me aside and said, I saw what you did. You never do that again, and I'll tell you why. And she helped me, genuinely. She made me want to do better every time. And over time, I did. Big difference between the two. And I don't think many people have much of an idea of what happens when a nasty sort of criticism happens, especially in the mind of a young person. We've seen it. But I believe that it says more about the criticizer. Don't you think? Galatians 5, verses 14 and 15 says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Are we supposed to bite and devour one another? Even if we see something wrong, even if we're correcting someone, even if we say, you know, we're doing this out of love. We want to help them. Fool. Does that work? No. If anything, it, it makes them resistant to the criticism. I know what happens to me. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And, and you might, if, you, if you've been with us longer than a couple of months, you might say to yourself, well, we just did this scripture over the summer. But you know, every time I read scripture, I get a little something else out of it. How about you? And it was last summer that I spoke about the prophet Nathan confronting King David for his sin with Bathsheba. And I'm not going to lie, this is a very difficult story to preach on. It really is. It's so honest about one of the greatest men chosen by God, but the details are very hard to hear. And on top of that, this isn't the sort of stuff that gets believers super excited. What do you think? It's sad. And I'm not even talking about the part that you might think I'm talking about. Because David, of course, we know the story. We probably all know it by heart by now. He sees Bathsheba, right? Commits adultery. Uh, she's married to a man named Uriah, David's friend. David realized what he had done. So he concocted a scheme to have Uriah killed. And then he would marry Bathsheba, and no one would be the wiser. Sound good? Hey, why not? You know, the internet hasn't been invented yet. No one will know. And like I said, we talked about this not too long ago. David committed adultery. He committed murder. He bore false witness. He coveted his neighbor's wife. He dishonored his parents. He made a false idol out of himself and his own power. And that's only to name a few of the Ten Commandments that he broke. And when a prophet named Nathan came to him, he told David a story about a man in a similar situation. He said that this poor man had but one ewe lamb that he loved. He loved this lamb more than anything. But a rich man who had many sheep stole it and prepared it to be cooked for a stranger. So meet me in verse 5 of 2 Samuel 12. It says, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb. How many times over? Four times over. Because he did such a thing and had no pity. And you know, when I was preaching this a few months ago, I almost stopped right then and there because I noticed something about this story that I had never noticed before. And I'm glad I didn't because now I have a sermon out of it. So important. I want everyone to remember just what David said here. He must pay for that lamb four times over. When you point the finger at someone, there are three fingers pointing back at you. Verse 7. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. 
I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. And David at this point, how do you think he's feeling? Probably this big. He knows he's in big trouble. Very big trouble. Verse 9, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the life of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. And boy, when God says something like that, if you're not scared, you don't know God. Right? Skip down to verse 12. He says, you did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son you born to you will die. And like I said, this is one of the most difficult stories to handle of the entire Bible, in my opinion. Why does the child die and not David? And you know, we serve such a wonderful God. And when we hear a story like this, we have to say to ourselves what Isaiah reminds us in chapter 55, his ways are not our ways. God still had plans for David. But David doesn't exactly get off scot-free here either. In these days, honor is everything. And David has to live with this public shame for the rest of his life, with or without the internet. He is forever remembered for this. And the whole kingdom knew about this sinful act of the king. And when confronted with it, David said he must pay. How many times? Four. I'm told that the worst pain a person can feel is losing a child. I've seen it. I've ministered to those people. And although I've never experienced it, every time it brings me to tears to think about it. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, and David is no exception. Verse 15. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted. He spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood behind him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child is dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied. He is dead. There's no greater agony than to feel this. And David made a judgment when his own sin was first presented to him. And he said the man should be punished four times. He had no idea that he was talking about himself, did he? You know, do we have, have you ever seen it? And Maybe you've done it yourself. You accuse somebody of something. And you judge them and you criticize. All the while you realize you're doing the same exact thing. You know, what I love it is when someone says, don't you judge me. I'm like, well, aren't you judging me? You know, it kind of goes around and around and around. And David, as it turns out, is doing that very thing. And I think if he had known what was going to happen, he would have chosen his words all the more carefully. Like I said, these are some of the most difficult stories to navigate through, especially on a Sunday morning. But when you read on the account of David's life, something even more terrible happens. David has a son named Amnon, truly disturbed uh, individual who commits a series of heinous acts, and his own brother Absalom kills him. 
David is incensed that Absalom would kill his brother, and it drives a significant wedge between David and Absalom. And in time, Absalom fulfills the prophecy that David's house would be at war with itself. And Absalom leads a rebellion against his own father. And how does it end? Absalom is killed by one of David's men. And finally, after David appoints Solomon to be his successor, another one of his sons, Adoniah, declares himself king and attempts his own rebellion. And what happens to Adoniah? He's put to death. What did David say when he was confronted with his own sin? He must pay for the lamb four times over. And one son was the judgment, but David's words made it worse. Words have consequences, don't they? Does God operate this way? Let me ask, does he say, well, well, David made a judgment, so four of his children now must die. You know, is God looking to get David kind of in a gotcha? I don't think so. This is a lesson on the power that we wield when we criticize without appropriate knowledge. This is what happens. And Jesus, he certainly had enough opportunity to be critical. I often wonder what would have happened had David gone to God and said, forgive my words. Forgive my words. But everyone that came to Jesus, I have to tell you, had something that he was fully capable and justified in criticizing. Wouldn't you say? Anyone that has ever approached Jesus, has a perfect person ever approached Jesus? Never. Because our God is perfect. But did he criticize? He built up, he encouraged, he rebuked the people he loved. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. And what we're about to read, it takes place after another story that we just read recently, right after the transfiguration of Jesus. And this is the story, of course, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the mountain, and they see Moses and Elijah appear before them. And uh, Peter, James, and John, they now know full well that Jesus is the Messiah. Moses and Elijah were witnesses, and they heard the audible voice of God saying, This is my son with whom I am pleased. Listen to him. And from here, Jesus continued with his ministry. And he's presented with many opportunities to criticize. But that's not our Jesus, is it? We're about to see the approach that he takes. So join me in Luke chapter 9, verse 37. The next day, this is the day after the mountain, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsion so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Let me ask, does Jesus have an opportunity to criticize right here? He sure does. You know, this is always such a great scripture when it comes to criticism. Let me ask you this. Have you ever criticized someone for the way their child acts? I'm smiling, yes. <laughs> Criticize someone, and, and maybe, maybe you're in the grocery store, and, and you see someone, and their, their children are misbehaving, throwing cereal or throwing a tantrum, or, or who knows what's happening. And you just say, oh, bad parents. And you keep going. You know, I remember in the grocery store when my kids were much younger, driving me nuts, and I received glares as it happened. Yeah, I'm talking about you, Rita Grace, yeah. (laughs) She has made me nothing but proud ever since. And I'll tell you, I I actually loved it because uh, the grocery store um, is is nothing compared to this. My kids weren't throwing themselves into convulsions and foaming at the mouth, but they might not have been so far off. Um, I believe that this man received his fair share of criticism because he comes from a society that says, who sinned? 
that this man might be blind? Who sinned that this man might be insane? And Jesus very easily could say, well, what did you do wrong? You know, did you not raise him to go to synagogue and, and learn all these things? What's your problem? Did you not teach him who our God is? The next thing that Jesus says, I absolutely love. Because so many take it harshly, but knowing what we know about Jesus, I think these words are always horribly taken out of context, where he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Boy, you ever read those and say to yourself, man, Jesus is pretty harsh when it comes to people. Man, maybe he got off the wrong side of the mountain this morning, and he's just angry. <clears throat> you know, knowing what you know about Jesus, do you think he really said it like this? I sure do. To our Western ears, maybe, we read something like that. But Jesus, he's not saying it out of criticism. This is how he spoke playfully with people that he loved. He says it throughout Scripture. Don't you think at some point they would have said, this guy isn't worth following if all he's going to do is be mean to us and call women dogs and call us uh, unbelieving and perverse? No, that's the way people spoke with one another back then. He's saying it because he needs everyone to know that they have this power. How long do I have to be with you? I need you to get this. And you weren't able to drive the demon out. Verse 42. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the parents, right? Jesus rebuked the boy, right? Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Happy ending, right? The end. Now it's time to start Mark. Not quite. But Jesus just had to do something that the disciples couldn't. Does Jesus have the opportunity to criticize his disciples? Why didn't you cast out the demon? Huh? Why not Bartholomew? I'm very disappointed in you. Boy, I take Peter, James, and John away just for a few days, and this is what happens. Matthew, what gives? You're never going to write anything worth reading. You know, Philip, no wonder nobody knows anything about you. Could Jesus have said those things? He had an opportunity, but that's not what he said. He tells them something that they need to know. It says, while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. In other words, gentlemen, time is getting short. And you need to listen to me all the more. And it's because I love you. It's because of the things that you're going to be able to do. Get this now. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Now we get to verse 46, which is one of my favorite stories of the entire Bible. Uh, because it always speaks to, to really who we are. Verse 46, an argument started among the disciples as to which one of them would be the greatest. Don't you just love these guys? Does Jesus have an opportunity to criticize? He most certainly does. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child with him, a little child, and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. And he gives them all something to think about. And they have a conclusion that they have to reach without him criticizing, without him tearing them down. This is something I know that you guys are going to discover if you just follow me. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop them because he doesn't go to Living Hope Church. I I'm telling you, I have heard that before. Maybe not word for word. They don't, people don't call me master. But I'm telling you, I've heard that before. 
you know, oh boy, a, a Baptist just did something good. How do you feel about that? How do you want me to feel about that? Does Jesus have an opportunity to criticize here? He most certainly does. But what does he say? Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Could Jesus have criticized these Samaritans? He most certainly could have, but he chose not to. And then it gets good. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Does Jesus have an opportunity to criticize? Every time. Every time. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. You can read all four Gospels this way. Does Jesus have an opportunity to criticize? And what does he do instead? He speaks life every single time. He shows them exactly what they need to see, and he tells them exactly what they need to know. It's so easy to criticize, wouldn't you say? You know, and and I'll be honest, I'm guilty of it. And and I'll tell you, I was a middle school teacher for several years. I had my share of criticism when students would say things to me. I'll never forget one day someone said to me, we're we're giving you a student today. I I, I was was teaching another class that normally wasn't mine. And they said, there's this one student in here, and she does not do well with criticism. And I thought, okay, well. Um, I'm putting a lesson together. What, what do I do here? And, and I'll never forget it because I, I was throwing this lesson together last minute, and I thought, well, I'm going to talk about the Hebrew language to a bunch of sixth graders. They'll get it. No problem. I always had fun with that. And I remember getting in front of the class and saying, who can tell me what language the Bible was written in? And one hand goes up, and it's the very girl who did not like criticism. And I knew she had problems at home, and I knew that it was, you know, not a good situation. What language? She raised her hand. She says Latin. And I said to myself, Lord, get me through this. How do I tell this girl that she's wrong? Because she was. And Holy Spirit comes upon me. I don't say that lightly. And I said, do you know why that's such a great answer? Because the Bible was in Latin for over a thousand years. And that's not a bad guess, but it was written in Hebrew. And she was so blessed by it. I don't say this because I did something great that day. I'm telling you, I did it because God put the words in my mouth that day. And I believe he can do the same for all of you. And by the end of the lesson, we were all singing the Hebrew alphabet together. It was great. But it is so easy to criticize. It is so easy to just say the first thing that comes to our mind when something is so blatantly wrong. Wouldn't you say? So easy. You know, before the service or during worship, I I really just started praying about this message. And I said, you know, Lord, is there anything missing from this message that I need to preach on? And, you know, I I know I'm always down on people who use their cell phones in church. But I just Googled, what does God say about me? And I believe that these are the things that we need to look to when someone gives you unfair criticism. But more importantly, I think that these are the things that we need to look to when we're about to criticize, don't you say? Another person in God's kingdom is God's treasure. What does God say about us? It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53. Psalm 1832, God arms me with strength and he makes my ways perfect. 1 John 2.12, I am writing you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. Ephesians 1.5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. Colossians 2.10, So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Isaiah 43.1, do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you. You are mine. And there's plenty more where that came from about what God says about you. Do you want the mind of Christ? Or do you want the words of the world? Because I think the mind of Christ is there to encourage one another, not to criticize so nasty and superficially. And I say it especially to those that are in constant contact with young people. They need to know who they are in Christ. This generation that's coming up, they don't know anything about themselves anymore, do they? What they know is what the world tells them about themselves. But I'm here to say they're created in the image of Christ. And God has a destiny for each and every one of them. So we're going to pray today. And I want to encourage everyone in here, if you are a criticizer, you're in a safe place. A safe place. Because look to your right, look to your left. There's plenty of us in here. Let's give that to God today. Isn't today a great day to do it? On top of that, I want to speak to those who feel criticized. Those who maybe something has been spoken over you, you'll never succeed. You know, let's speak to that. Let's speak our identity, God's identity into your life today. It works so many different ways. We're going to have people down here that want to pray for you. Or you can pray with the person next to you. You're in a safe place. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand. And the words that we pray today will speak life. So Heavenly Father, I speak over everyone in here today. I speak over this congregation. I speak to those who have criticized. I'm just I'm asking today for just a clean slate that when we use the words of David, even when we use them on ourselves, that we know that they have consequences. But God, you cover that. You cover that with your light, with your grace. Your light shines through the darkness, even if the darkness is what's coming out of our mouths. Lord, I speak to those who feel criticized, those who have had words spoken over them. We break those off in Jesus' name. We break them off with the mighty power that your Son gave us. God, I thank you so much. And I speak a blessing over everyone here, that they might know your identity. And God, if we're more like you, we give life. And we speak that with our words. May our words speak life over ourselves, over our families, over our friends, over our country, over everyone that we love and everyone that we don't love. God, we thank you and we love you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And everyone said, amen. If you need prayer, please feel free to come down. We would love to pray with you. And if not, we will see you next week or maybe even this week. All right, see you later.